Full name is uh, Thomas Butterworth Quimby, and I was here from 19, July 1974 to February 1988. From 74 to 79, I was a field rep in Dutchess and Ulster counties with uh, 33 contracts in both of those. From 79 to 81, I was director of education, 81 or 82, and from 82 to 88, I was director of LEAP. Okay, and uh, what, what have you done uh, subsequently since uh, leaving CSEA? Um, I've been working with Cornell School of Industrial and Labor Relations um, in uh, mostly dispute resolution, um, interest-based bargaining, uh, mostly toward management areas uh, because that's where the demand seems to be. Um, I wonder if you remember when you first heard of an organization called CSEA. I don't know when I first heard of it exactly, but I do know that uh, when I got out of graduate school at Cornell, um, I got offers from uh, ICI and Corning Glass and somebody else. and uh, and. CSEA was unique because it was the one union that would hire people who hadn't come up through the ranks. It would hire outside people to be, uh, to be field reps. And so I decided, well, if you go to work for a union first and, and then leave, that's better than going to work somewhere else and then trying to work for a union. So, so that's uh, why I went to work for CSEA. So how is it that you actually came to be employed by CSEA? I think I, I just I decided that I wanted to work for a union, and if I was going to do that, I better do that when I was young, and young. And uh, I remember the uh, job interview. I know that Alice Adams was there, uh, who was chapter or lo local president of Dutchess County. Jim Moore was there. There were some other people there. I can't remember, but there were it was quite a hiring interview because you walk in and there's eight people that are sitting there. And uh, you're kind of going, eh, a little bit like that. But then uh, they'd done their homework and they'd said, well, now supposing uh, a member wanted you to process a non-meritorious grievance, what would you do? And I said, well, I'd, I'd try to uh, dissuade them based on the merits of the grievance. And they said, well, what would, you, what would you do if he still wanted you to process the grievance? And I said, well, I'd, I might find them some uh, arbitration decisions or something like that and show them some similar cases and how they were ruled and, and try to give them the basis for my determination. And they said, what would you do if he still wanted to do it? And I said, well, I'd look around the bargaining unit. I'd see you know, what kind of friends he had and how much political support he had. And if he had a lot, I'd probably go with it. <laughs> he said, that's our boy. <laughs> so they hired me. So what uh, what did you actually do when you were first uh, when you were first hired? Um, they gave it was kind of funny because they gave the new people that were hired political subdivisions. The older guys with more seniority got the state stops, and that was because state stops were day work. They didn't have any negotiation in them, and the political subs were day work and night work, which I discovered uh, when I was when I was negotiating and. Uh, so I was doing uh, counties, cities, towns, school districts, um, grievances, negotiation. The, the tougher stuff, the, the bigger bargaining units, they gave to people like Manny Vitale or Roger Kane, who were some of the, the collective bargaining specialists. But I remember at one time having 18 contracts open. That was bad planning on my part or something like that. It was a tough job. You go out the door at 8 o'clock, 8.30 in the morning, get home 11, 12, 1 o'clock at night, get up, go out the door 8.30 in the morning, and you do that three or four days a week, week after week after week. I would imagine those must have been pretty interesting times, though. You're freshly out of school, and you've yeah. got um, uh, basically a new law. Uh, the Taylor Law was relatively young at that time. Yeah. I would assume that was, you were probably making up some of it as you went along. Yeah, you couldn't, people were still afraid of fact-finding. Employers were still afraid of fact-finding. Now nobody really gives a hoot about it, I don't think. Um, th we had the first strike in, uh, in Dutchess County, in a, in a county in New York State, in Dutchess County in 1976. Um, back then we gave uh, 
people at picketed, I think, $5 a day for picketing and, and sandwiches for lunch. Were, were you the field rep at that time? I was, yeah. Well, can you explain a little bit about uh, how that came about? Um, I think, as I recall, it was just a matter of, well, there were, since I think it was the first strike at fairly high stakes, there was a fair amount, I think, that, that I wasn't exactly privy to. There was something funny that was going on between uh, Bernie Veet, who's now deceased, who was the uh, unit president, the local president. And, uh, and goodness knows who else. But I think it was just a good classic case of they didn't come forward with enough that, uh, that we thought they should have, and it was eventually resolved. And Manny Vitale was negotiating that contract, and, and uh, it, was, it was very interesting. I remember, unfortunately, uh, my uh, marriage, I think, was starting to dis disintegrate at the time, and I was trying to salvage it. and, and uh, took a vacation. When I came back, I got a call about 5 o'clock in the morning, you know, get your hiney out of bed and get down there and take care of the picket line because <laughs> there's a strike going on, which was the same time that uh, Ted Wenzel, I think, had, had uh, gone in and signed the Thruway Authority contract. I guess they'd been negotiating for two years or something like that, or three years, and, and uh, Wenzel, I guess, had just finally had it and went in and closed the deal himself. and. I don't think it was put up for ratification, and because uh, legally you don't have to have a contract ratified. That's not in the Taylor Law. I think that a contract has to be ratified by the uh, membership. And uh, uh, Bill McGowan was interviewed. I remember hearing it on the radio, and they said to uh, Ted Wenzel, "Well, now that the contract has been signed and the membership is." Uh, I can't remember exactly what the quote was, but Wenzel's answer to it was, well, that's a very good question to which I don't have a very good answer. <laughs> this is McGowan. No, that was Wenzel, actually. Wenzel and then McGowan, McGowan, who was the vice president, said, well, this is a, a democratic union. The membership has spoken. And, and uh, you know, it was just interesting to see the, the two of them. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, so just to go back to Duchess, what, yeah. so, so what were the circumstances of the actual strike? What did they actually do? And how long did it uh, did it last? Um, I think it was I think it was around a week. It wasn't over two weeks. Um, uh, we set up uh, pickets. I think early in the morning we were quite successful. I think in keeping people out uh, from work. My uh, area was the county office building. Um, there were the typical uh, picket signs. I think everybody on the line was pretty well behaved. Some of the others, like uh, Orange County strike was, was the worst, I think. But, but Duchess, since it was new, um, I can, we came away with quite a good package. I can't remember exactly what it was. But what were the ramifications for CSEA in terms of Taylor Law penalties? Well, there were the, uh, that I think people were feeling their way about also. There were the Section 210 hearings um, where you're, those are where you're, you're presumed guilty and at the 210 hearing you try to prove your innocence. Um, I think uh, our regional attorney Tom Ahar, who was a, a very good regional attorney, probably put both his kids through college on the, the 210 hearings and all the, the legal work he had to do. But he, he did a very good job of it. But basically, the outcome of this was that the members felt uh, empowered. They felt like they had uh, uh, made their point and came away with it. Yeah, they had. We, that was, uh, I think the county didn't believe that, that uh, CSCA was going to strike, and we, we did, and we pretty well shut the place down. And, and uh, I don't know if they gave us exactly everything that we wanted, but, uh, but it was a, I can't remember the specifics, but as I recall, it was a pretty good package. You, you referenced an Orange County strike. Were you involved with that? Yeah, what they used to do, um, it was very interesting times because uh, we weren't an AFL-CIO affiliate at the time, so we used to get, we didn't have Article 20 protection, so we, we used to get raided a lot. And when there was either a strike or a raid, you needed to drop what you were doing, your own field area, and, and go take care of that and try to do two field areas as best you could. And, 
and Orange County was, uh, Orange County went on for two weeks. Um, the, uh, we only had, I think, about barely 50% of the people out, which was why it dragged on. It turned out that the mediator had had an offer in his pocket that he didn't give our negotiator. He was waiting until we got sore enough and, and uh, troubled enough to take what he had to offer, so he kept the offer in his pocket for two weeks. And, and uh, if, he, if, he, if the mediator had come out and, and given the offer to our negotiator, it would have been a much shorter strike. There was somebody that got run over and got her leg broken, and, and uh, it was during the winter. It was ugly. Th those uh, two examples that you just described mm -hmm. uh, really seem to be the exception rather than the rule in terms of CSEA's uh, history. There haven't been a lot of uh, uh, strikes. Wh why do you think that is? That there that they, they were haven't. that there haven't been. Well, oddly enough, there was also it was funny because there was a spate of them. There was Rockland County, which followed Orange County, and that was over New Year's Eve, because I remember toasting my hands over a trash barrel on New Year's <laughs> Eve. And uh, we all got a bottle and passed it around, and that was a very good one. There was Yonkers School District, which was uh, quite good uh, in that we got what we want. There was Putnam County, where we thought we were going to have to go out, but we didn't because the uh, county executive or the sheriff said, you got more field reps here than I got deputies. We can't do this. <laughs> and they, uh, but that, you're right. And I don't know why they all happened in that area. And you're right, there haven't been very few since then. I think that uh, employers got smarter about invoking the provisions of the Taylor Law is really pretty draconian as far as strikes goes. And I, I think after the, uh, the jubilation wore off and it became apparent how expensive it was and, and uh, the damage, I mean, strikes are just plain ugly. And uh, they, they create uh, bad blood that people feel for a long, long time. And, and to the union, I think they were quite expensive. And uh, so it became something that was used much more sparingly, if at all. What was, uh, what was the uh, relationship between members and the staff back in those days? Well, that's a good question. I, I think some of it obviously depended on the bargaining unit. Um, uh, You tried to do, when, when you were a field rep, you obviously tried to do as good a job as you could, but you couldn't make, it, it was hard because management was never happy to see you. The uh, local presidents, you could never really do enough for them because they had political ambitions, obviously. That's the way it is. And the membership, you know, their grievance is, is important. And if you can't get the grievance, you know, what good are you? Um, but I did have some, some very good uh, relationships with some people. It was also made more difficult because without Article 20 protection, SEIU, for instance, used to come in and try to take over. S uh, SEIU and NYSA. NYSA was much more, SEIU we could usually beat. NYSA was much more formidable, especially in school districts because teachers had cachet. And uh, uh, everybody aspired to, to have teacher status in an organization and tried to achieve that, I think, by becoming a member of the teachers' union if it was offered to them. So the teachers really did pretty well. I lost, I never lost anything to SEIU. I lost two of the teachers. I lost Pine Plains School District and I lost Allenville School District. Uh, you, you kind of referenced before the fact that with the staff there was a little bit of a split between those who had the more senior folks having the um, state yep. stops yep. versus the uh, younger or, or more junior staff having uh, the, uh, the local government uh, mm -hmm. stops. Was there a real, uh, almost like a cultural divide between those two areas or was the approach still pretty much the same? I think there was a cultural divide. I think some of that is a, is a function of age where you got younger people that were still pretty vigorous and, you know, wanted to go out and 
and do something. There were four guys, and, uh, and I say guys because they were guys, and uh, Dutchess County that were hired all together. Well, there was George Senko, Frank Martirana, Larry Scanlon, and myself, and they put us all in a common place. The more senior people with the state stops had separate offices. They put all the new guys in a, a place that we called the pit. <laughs> And when you were talking to people, you'd have to talk to people like this so you could hear the person on the other end of the phone. But we had a lot of fun because we could overhear each other's phone conversations and make editorial comments and try to crack each other up, you know, while somebody was talking on the phone. We'd, we'd uh, make jokes, perhaps, about what they were having to deal with and, and try to crack them up. Was, was the orientation of the, the statewide organization more towards the state uh, units or... Uh, was there um, uh, an opportunity for the local governments to be heard? I think there was I think there was opportunity for the local governments to be heard, and I think the local government I, th I think within the whole union, the state probably got more emphasis, but I think that the political subdivision, this is just for the perspective of somebody who was working with them, I think the political subdivision people realized that they had more control over their destiny than the state people did because they negotiated their own collective bargaining agreements. So, so it was sort of a much more full service operation. I think the relationships tended to be closer between the people that worked in political subdivisions and their officers than between the state and their officers. But I can't really say for sure because I never had any state stops. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the late 70s then, you came up to CSEA headquarters uh, uh, to become director of education? Yep, 79. Were, was that the first time that there had been an actual director of uh, education or well, did they have a program before that? They had Dr. Diamond before that. I don't know that they let him do a whole lot. I don't know if he want. you know, for whatever reason there wasn't a lot going on. And, uh, and, uh, I remember we were affiliating with uh, we were affiliating with AFSCME, and it kind of broke my heart because AFSCME's big thing was education. And just at the time that I became director of education, we affiliated with AFSCME. So I got half half a secretary. Uh, I because the intent was a lot of the education program was was, was, was going to come from, from AFSCME, AFSCME. And, I, and I remember having a discussion with uh, with Dave Williams, who was trying to. Uh, be the one of the one of the many ambassadors with the American Express with the AFSCME American Express card, um, and uh, and uh, uh, we had a were were somewhat uh, intoxicated at a convention, which office ha often happened. And Dave said, "I can't understand you people. I'll give you anything you want." And I said, "Anything?" And he said, "Anything." And I said, "I want." Uh, Asked me to pay for four staff people that I want to identify <laughs> and hire. And he went, God damn it, quit yanking my chin. <laughs> a good time was had by all. So, so what was your charge then when you, when you became the uh, uh, director of education? What were you trying to do? Well, at the beginning, um, I was trying to, uh, to, train the membership and the stewards in uh, how to file grievances and protect the rights of the membership. And one of the valuable things that I did learn from AFSCME, and it was really, it was really quite valuable, was that organizing is really much more important than policing a contract. And it's a subtle, it was a very subtle, it took me a while to catch on Explain to it. Explain that a little bit. Well, that it's, it's a little hard it's a little hard to explain, um, but the more empowered, and I'd, I've come to find that word as a cliche and I try not to use it, but it has utility, the more empowered people feel, the stronger they are. And um, strength of, if you can put strength of spirit together with strength of collective bargaining agreement, that's great. If you if you just have collective bargaining agreement, then you're 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 litigious as opposed to forceful, and and there's a difference. Uh, that's probably that, that's as well as I can explain it um, on one balance. And AFSCME used to have a great recipe for uh, 
for their education programs. I used to sweat over mine, but but they'd uh, and it worked. Doggone it, it worked every time. They'd come in, and, and the format would be uh, 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 get into buzz groups, okay? And they get into buzz groups. Uh, identify your ten biggest problems, okay? Prioritize your ten biggest problems. Report out. Go back into buzz groups. Come up with your ten best <laughs> answers. <laughs> Prioritize your ten best. And it worked because people like uh, people like people would sooner. And this was another value. People would sooner figure out stuff for themselves. And and that sounds obvious, but I I hadn't seen it. And uh, I don't think a lot of other people really saw it either. Well, while we're on the subject of, uh, of asking, tell me what you remember the most about uh, the affiliation, how it came about, what uh, uh, media changes it brought, what <coughs> the whole climate was. Can I take about a two-minute break here? Maybe? Sure. Yeah. Okay, Steve. okay let's, let's pick it up and talk a little bit about the AFSCME affiliation. What do okay. you remember about uh, those times? Well, the first... What preceded it, George Meany was uh, president of the AFL-CIO, and they had, they obviously didn't like independent unions. Um, they wanted everybody under their umbrella. And I think they subsidized uh, SEIU largely to, to come after us, and the idea was that they were just going to beat us into submission so that we were going to wind up losing uh, unit after unit until such time as we decided to affiliate and pay the per capita and yada, yada, yada. And was there a real internal debate in CSEA as to whether to join the AFL-CIO? Oh, there was a good, vigorous debate. And there was uh, a rumor, I don't know how true it was, that uh, we had a chance, there was some clerical, some small clerical union that we had a chance directly to affiliate with uh, if we would be willing to pay the president of that union who would lose his position because CSEA would obviously swallow up the clerical. If we would give the, the uh, person, the, the, the president of the clerical union, a job, and that's rumor. I don't know for sure, but uh, rumor has it that Wenzel uh, turned it down and said, well, you know, who would we that's dumb. We don't want to do that. Why should we give somebody a job for life? So then we started getting seriously hammered. And uh, the representation, we lost the PS&T. The, there were two. There was a regular election and there was a runoff. And uh, I remember being in Wasag Developmental Center trying to tell the, uh, the staff people that worked there from the clients while my own field area went to hell. And uh, there was a, th so there was a lot of a, Really, that was really quite a better election. I think there were some of us that really took it kind of hard because of all of the representation within CSEA that the PS&T had. Most of the officers in the state were PS&T officers. They had a large number of people on the board, and then they're, you know, crying that they weren't well enough uh, represented and blah blah blah. blah. So they were going to go. Form well, when, you, when you say it was it was bitter in in, in what way? Uh, it, did that manifest itself in, in the work sites in the in the fight? Uh, well, there was some fairly acid campaign literature, which I remember coming up with some ideas for, and was very pleased uh, uh, for having come up with them. Um, uh, there was some uh, uh, acrimony that between uh, some of the, the the people that were going to become officers of PEF or who did were going back sort of doing the yeah and yeah, you know, we beat you, no you're not good, blah, 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 blah. You couldn't find your way out of a paper bag uh, or worse. Um, so it was pretty bitter. Okay, so then to get back to the AFSCME affiliation, yep. PEF has left CSEA. There's obviously a movement in the AFL-CIO to put pressure on uh, uh, CSEA. Right. We have lots what of we have lots of raids. Uh, I think we had a trial affiliation, I believe, from '78 to '81, where we got a reduced per capita. Um, and during that time, there were a lot of uh, 
very well. I mean, I, I give AFSCME, I give the AFSCME reps credit for, a, for they really took a fair amount of crap and took it quite graciously from, from us who felt kind of humiliated that we were even considering that. It's sort of like, yeah, want to fight, you know? And, the, and so the AFSCME reps would offer to buy us a drink or pull up the American Express card. This, this is even with the staff. Oh yeah. Even with the staff, yeah. not well, just the members. Yeah, well we were, yeah, we were all pretty well charged up because we'd been uh, going through strikes and doing representation elections and, and uh, I remember carrying a breaker bar in my front seat, you know, with my roofing nails, which was standard <laughs> issue for, <laughs> for strikes and my bottle of Southern Comfort under the front seat that I used to take a good swig of in the, I mean, everybody was just, uh, I didn't do that normally, this was just during, uh, crises and uh, and so we were just in a mood to fight that's sort of like we're under attack screw everybody and uh, so they kind of calmed us down and Bob McEnroe I think I don't know if he still would ask me or not but he, he was passed. oh he did I'm yeah, sorry to hear that huh. um, I can't remember uh, St Steve Fantazzo uh, he and I understood each other for some reason well, uh, I liked Steve. Um, can't remember some of the other people, but uh, so there were various. Uh, there was a lot that went on that I really wasn't privy to. There were there were there was kind of an obviously an inner circle people of the of the. Uh, I don't know whether it's the second floor or the third floor, whatever. But um, even when I was director of education or director of LEAP, there was a lot of stuff that went on that that I didn't. Uh, I just got the tail end of it that said, sort of, here, here's your marching orders. But the, um, the trial affiliation period uh, was basically a courtship where AFSCME was uh, coming in and uh, um, uh, trying to build a relationship with the CSEA. Yeah. They how, how did, you know, you, you said the staff, there was obviously some tension. Right. How did, uh, uh, how did that evolve with the membership? I think, the, well, the membership, the membership was in a different position because I think they were much more positive to it because they had the sense that they were being wooed. I think the staff, some of us had the sense that, that we'd failed because we were having to do this. And if we were really good, uh, we would have defended CSEA to the death and, and uh, we wouldn't have to do this thing. I think there were, maybe I was the only one, but I think there was part of me that felt a little humiliated about, you know what, we couldn't pull us off and now we got to deal with these people coming in, we're going to have to pay them a lot of money and, and, uh, and uh, listen to people come in that tell us how things are that don't know anything about, you know, whatever, same crap, you've heard it. <laughs> so then at this point though, you're now the Director of uh, Education and so you're actually trying to work and coordinate with uh, with yeah, we're now past the trial. I think I was director during the trial and, and during the permanent. And um, I was looking for staff because I had half a secretary to, and me that was responsible for the whole state. And uh, um, I was uh, looking for staff people and I wasn't going to get them because, you know, everything was going to come from AFSCME and, and uh, you know, we didn't need staff people and it was a long, hard uh, fight to get staff people. But I mean, in the, in the end, there was a CSEA education staff. Yeah, built and we had a very, yeah, and, and thanks in, in large part, I think, to John Dowling and Bailey Walker, who I had you you could talk methodology with them and programming and stuff. I mean, this wasn't just rah rah. You know, you could sit down and you could have an intelligent conversation about this is why this stuff works. Uh, here's what we found to be effective. Uh, let's look at the latest uh, film or slideshow that uh, we put together. Tell me what you think of it. Uh, does it work? Doesn't it work? There was a good. Uh, collegial relationship I found so after a while I was well pleased for them. Um, tell me about the founding of the Labor Education Action Program. Oh yeah well uh, that was that was another one um, 
that I didn't really know what was going to happen uh, basically until it happened. I think I was told to put together some kind of proposal for state negotiation. I think it would have been the 82 negotiation or 84. I can't remember. I can't remember how they fell. But uh, um, I think in part, uh, we, I think we started with three, three or three and a half mil over three years. It was, its purpose was to provide uh, post-secondary, probably job-related education. Um, I think in part we got it because the Governor's Office of Employee Relations was trying to screw the Department of Civil Service and consolidate the, the grip that it had on labor relations, including training money and and uh, money that you could use to put people to work that you wanted to put people to work. Um, and uh, so the, the memory that sticks in my mind the most from that one was that, that uh, I, you know, somebody called me into a room, it started the tail end of the negotiation, and, and uh, Bill McGowan, who I liked a great deal and had a great deal of respect for, he wasn't, uh, wasn't polished, but he was smart and he had a great deal of integrity. Um, he said, he took a cigar out of his mouth and he said, well, here's three and a half mil. And, uh, and uh, Sandy Frucher said, yeah, and don't fuck up. And that was the, that was the advice I was given. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so obviously you didn't. <laughs> well, I, I, I didn't. It was, I think I was pretty conservative because at the beginning, uh, I thought that there was kind, there was kind of going to be kind of a war, and we need to establish as much as we could our autonomy from the state. And uh, I banged heads with the state a good deal. Probably some of it unnecessarily, but I like to think that uh, I made life a lot easier for Ira Baumgarten, who, is that, I'm, who, who uh, followed me and softened up the state so that he could do some of the good innovative stuff that uh, that he's done. So with the, so the, the LEAP program, as it was mm -hmm. called, basically provided uh, tuition reimbursement to state employees who wanted to further their higher education? Well, it, reimbursement was part of it, but the majority of it was actually prepaid. There was no, we, we uh, God, we had that, we hired one consultant that turned out to be abysmal, uh, but fortunately we didn't pour a lot of money on him, and we hired a, a guy named Jim Kipler, who I think used to work for the teacher's retirement system, who wrote us based on what we wanted to do. And it was one of the more intellectually challenging exercises that I had. We had to construct an algorithm that would cue people in order and allocate courses fairly because we knew, obviously, we had much more, many more people than slots. So the question is, how are we going to intelligently, fairly, and consistently uh, get, get people into these slots. And we constructed about a 10-step algorithm that required 32 uh, sub-programs that Jim Kittler wrote the uh, sub-programs for. It was on, and I can't remember what uh, kind of IBM computer it was, but it was slow enough so that, you know, we get the thing all queued up and then we go, Kaching, and it would have to run all weekend and half of Monday to spit out all of the printout of who was going to get. It was really, it was a nice piece of work, and thank God I had some really good people um, that that worked in it that that helped me do it. But it was a that was a. I was afraid that. Um, I was not going to be able to pull it off, and I had, um, there was a lot of mental struggle and a lot of blackness. Um, and I remember uh, going to the conventions, and uh, you'd need to present your report, and you could see the line forming at the microphone of people, and you knew who was going to ask you a knowledge question, who was just getting up there to break your ass, and who was your ally. <laughs> see this, this line forming, and it finally dawned on me probably about two years before I left, and it's sort of like, well, duh, but it's like, you know what, 
you are the servant of these people. This is their program that you have custody of, so of course they're entitled to, answer, to, to answers to their questions, and you listen to them and you give them good answers, you know, as well as you can, as opposed to, you know, doggone it, why do you have to screw up? You know, we thought about this, we know. I mean, I wouldn't say that, but that's what's going through your head. And, uh, and things got a lot easier after that, surprisingly enough. As you were putting the LEAP program together, did you have any models to follow? None. I didn't. I mean, maybe there were. I looked for some. Uh, I didn't find any. Most of them were based on uh, tuition reimbursement. And we wanted, I mean, tuition reimbursement, you got to have the money to put up front. And we didn't want to have to, uh, we didn't want to have to do that. So we identified courses at uh, schools, some community colleges, largely some four-year schools around the area that we thought we were appropriate, uh, passed out a catalog uh, to various places. People applied for them. And, uh, and one of the, the queuing principles about who got in first was did the person apply and was rejected because they'd go to the head of the queue the next time they applied. And there was, there was com it was quite a complex, um, but th there weren't, there weren't any models that I knew of. So this was largely a groundbreaking member benefit. Yes, it was. And it wasn't, um, and IRA has done a great deal with it since then. There was probably some much more uh, innovative stuff um, that I could have done had I felt more secure with the Governor's Office of Employee Relations, but there were some some people over there that I thought were going to steal our thunder, and I didn't particularly want it stolen. So, um. so, so this this was a program that <coughs> basically gave CSEA members the opportunity to better themselves and ostensibly to advance in their uh, careers. Yes. Yep. Yeah, and we we had courses targeted for. Uh, various bargaining units. There, there, we had operational courses, institutional courses, and administrative courses. And if you were in the institutional bargaining unit and applied for a course that was more job related uh, to your actual function, uh, you went ahead farther in the queue. You got more priority than uh, if you were in the operational unit and wanted to take. Uh, I don't know, typing or something. Okay. Um, <coughs> one of the things I think is always interesting about CSEA, uh, particularly uh, since the PS&T unit has gone on the state mm -hmm. side, you very often see situations where people will go through the CSEA ranks and then actually advance out of uh, the bargaining unit. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think that uh, creates in terms of the dynamic for the, uh, for the union, uh, in terms of uh, having uh, um, satisfied and capable uh, members uh, available for union activity and involvement? That's an interesting question. Well, I think to the, it's different, it's not as prevalent. I don't know what your ratio of state is to political subdivision. The problem that you describe isn't, isn't a player in the political subdivision because in political subs you represent. Although sometimes you see all, people going to management ranks. Uh, right, all of them. But I think, I think the, the tip-off point for going into a management rank is a higher threshold than, than for going into the ps and I've seen, I don't know that it's really that big, I don't know that it's really that big a factor because I think a lot of people's uh, success and effectiveness in, in being a union officer has to do with heart. I mean, obviously a lot of it has to do with mental horsepower also, but I think a lot of it um, has to do with an heart and with, with heart and uh, dedication to the, to the labor movement. And I think that may be more present uh, in the, at, at 
sort of lower organizational rank perhaps than it is when you get in and higher uh, and higher I don't think I don't know that that's a problem really okay. um, as, as you look back over the time that you spent in CSEA what mm -hmm. do you think were the uh, most important benchmark events well Dutchess County strike the Dutchess County strike was probably one just because that was uh, historic um, the loss of the PS and T obviously is another. Uh, the affiliation with AFSME, um, the affiliation with AFSME is another. Um, well, uh, the passage of the Taylor Law obviously that happened before I was there. You can't have a union. Harder to have a union without a collective bargaining statute. Uh, I'd say those were probably probably the biggies. Okay. Um, tell me about some of the personalities that uh, that you work with. I mean, you, you mentioned a few of them in passing, but yeah. uh, tell me about your experiences with Ted Wenzel. I didn't have a, a whole lot of, of contact with him. Um, he wasn't really what I would have conjured up in my mind, I don't think, for a union president. I think President McGowan was more the prototypical uh, union president. Didn't have a whole lot to do. Uh, part of that was because I was a field rep and Ted didn't get to Dutchess and Ulster County all that much. What was, what, what was your perception of him? Um, not Probably not in terribly close touch with the membership and maybe educated beyond the point of contact with the people that he represented. <laughs> I mean, nice enough guy, but uh, didn't. Uh, I was very glad when Bill McGowan got elected. I thought, well, you know, by God, now we've got somebody that, that I can work for well. Can you think of a, um, an anecdote about uh, Bill McGowan that kind of uh, captures the man? Well, I do. I don't know that this captures him. Really, I'd have to think about that. But I do know that when I went to talk to him about, I was usually looking for money or support or something for Leap or the uh, as director of education. And if he if he took your proposal and put it in his briefcase and said, "I'm going to take it home and study it," you're screwed. <laughs> you could pretty well kiss it goodbye. And I remember his. Secretary, I could never pronounce her last name, but it was Kathy Wojo. We called her Wojo for short. Called me up one afternoon, and, and I, I always made sure that I stayed on good terms with her, which wasn't hard because she was very nice. But she was a good yardstick. You know, I call her up and say, "Is Bill in, is Bill in a good mood? I got to get something done." And she'd tell me, "Yeah, come. No, don't come." And so, for the you know, that was worth a couple of dinners, and, and I appreciated her. Uh, but one afternoon she called me up and she said, have you got anything that needs to get signed or executed? And I said, well, there's uh, some stuff, but it's not quite done yet. She said, bring it up here. I said, it's not done yet. She said, have I ever steered you wrong? Bring it up here. <laughs> I said, okay. So I did. And uh, I walked in and, and, uh, and he approved it. I don't know what happened that afternoon, but just three or four things. Bing, 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 bing. Okay. How about, uh, tell me a little bit about uh, Joe McDermott. I didn't think he thought terribly highly of the staff. I think it was there. I think one of the reasons that I decided to go to work for Cornell was that the election there were the election was between McDermott and Moore, and and it was going to be hard uh, going from working for uh, Bill McGowan to working for, for either one of them. I th you know, it would have been different. I probably could have got used to it, but it's kind of like, well, Tom, maybe it's time you, you look somewhere else. Because by that time, I'd been there for 14 years. And, and, uh, How about uh, Irene Carr? Irene Carr was very, was always very supportive, very good-hearted. Um, I liked Irene a good deal. It always seemed like she had the uh, 
the interest of the membership at heart, which uh, I'm sure McDermott and Moore did as well. But uh, um, what what do you remember about the um, the young Danny Donahue as the region president on Long Island? I remember meeting him a couple of times when we went down there. Long Island to me always seemed like kind of an entity unto itself because I was from upstate and, and the only thing that was more foreign than Long Island was New York City. Uh, but, but he certainly um, uh, had a good reputation. He was, always, he was always very personable and very cordial and took the time to talk to you, which I, which I appreciated. And he, he did I went to the LEAP dinner that they had, uh, the celebration of how many years of LEAP or whatever, and he showed up at that and he gave a really nice talk. It was like he gave a hoot about that. And uh, so. What would you say uh, would be the, the best thing that happened to you while you were at CSEA and the worst thing that happened to you <laughs> while you were at CSEA? Ah, golly. Um, oh. Well, the w one of the worst, I don't know that I'll be able to get to the best thing because I'll have to think about that, but the, the thing that sticks in my mind the hardest was when I was director of education, I put together the first staff training program they ever had, which was a bunch of uh, four workshops that we delivered to the regions and uh, culminating in a uh, meeting at, at Lake George. And we had uh, groups set up that were going to solve a case, and I had planned on working the regional directors in with the groups. Well, I'm up there and I'm kind of sweating hoping this thing is going to go because this isn't peanuts, you know, it costs money to lodge people and bring them up and blah, 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 blah. And I didn't want the thing to flop. So I got a call from Dolan. Uh, that's one person we haven't talked about who was quite prominent. I got a call from Dolan who calls me in and there's all the regional directors standing there with Dolan, Quimby standing by himself, and Joe's saying, well, Tom, I think the most appropriate role for the regional directors is to walk around to the various work groups and make sure that people are working. I don't think they ought to be in those groups. Do you? Rhetorical question, you know, they're all, what am I going to say? So obviously they'd gone to him and said, screw this, you know, we're not going to be, a, we're going to be a policing function. So I said, you know, I clearly looked like I disagreed with him, but I said, well, if that's the way it's going to go down, that's the way it's going to go down and uh, went out and proceeded to have a good deal to drink because we were having a banquet. And, and uh, then at the banquet, Joe gets up and he puts his arm around me and he said, Tommy, you've done a great job. <laughs> I said, I feel like a fire hydrant in a parade of dogs. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the best thing, Probably the memory of toasting my hands over a trash barrel during the Rockland County strike where we turned out to be victorious. That was, that was uh, appropriate exercise of muscle and it, uh, it paid off well. Why, why do you think CSEA has been able to uh, uh, survive and uh, endure for close to 100 years? Well, I think we have I think, you know, and I still use a we. I haven't worked here in, since 88, but I still, you know, I still catch, but so it, it sticks with you. I, for some reason, I think it builds a good deal of loyalty. CSEA has a certain innocence that in the short term sometimes it, it can kind of get in the way, but in the long term, I think it's what keeps it honest uh, and attuned to the membership. And you can't say that, unfortunately, about uh, about all labor unions. So, um, and I think that the fact that CSEA is is uh, very much a grassroots organization helps. But I think, and there's a there was a, a, a professor at Cornell, Maurice Newfeld, who who died last year at about 90. But he always said to me when he heard, I had him in graduate school at Cornell, when I heard that uh, he heard that I was going to work for CSCA, he said, great, I have a tremendous amount of admiration for them because they're a very democratic union. And this was a guy that believed in democracy. And every time I saw him, he just, how are things at CSCA? Great union, democratic. So, and he was a well-respected person in his field. So I think. The fact that it's democratic, um, that it that maybe because of that it has a certain innocence, 
I think that keeps it going and helps protect it. Good stopping point. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, this was great.